afternoon, everybody. It is uh, it is two p.m. We are in the art, science, and atheism panel. Sorry, the other way around. We are in the atheism, science, and art panel, uh, hosted by Amy Davis Roth and Glendon Mello, who is having internet connection problems and will rejoin as soon as he can. Uh, I will be monitoring for questions for the panel via the chat room that you can access by going to ftbcon.org and clicking on the How to Participate link. Uh, and I'm going to turn the entirety of the panel over to Amy until time for QA. Hey, everyone. So welcome to our panel. I'm Amy Davis Roth. A lot of you know me as Surly Amy. I write for Skeptic.org. I'm also managing editor for Mad Art Lab, which is a website that deals with the intersection of art, science, atheism, geekery, and all kinds of other wonderful things. I have brought with me today some fantastic artists, and some of which are also scientists. And hopefully, we will get Glendon back on here soon. But we'll start off by doing some quick introductions. I've already told you who I am. I also make Surly Ramics, which is probably what I will be talking about when we are talking about our art today. Uh, Surly Ramics is jewelry that is handmade. It's ceramic, and I use it oftentimes to promote the ideas of critical thinking, secularism, humanism, and other issues that I find important that enrich my life. So I'm going to start off by having everyone introduce themselves. So we'll start with Anne. This connection is probably not doing Hi so well everyone. Um, <laughs> Go ahead, Anne. Yes, yeah, so if, if I sound awful, if I sound awful, it's because I am currently up in the hills of Mendocino with my family in law having a little weekend vacation. Um, so I apologize for that. Um, but as Amy said, my name is Anne and I write for madartlab.com uh, generally about food and drink science. I'm not a trained scientist, but I do find it interesting to go in and look at the reasons that the things that we cook work the way they do, why they taste the way they do, why they affect our bodies in the ways that they do, um, and the same for alcohol. <laughs> um, I'm famous around the lab for my cocktail skills, um, which I've done a little bit professionally where I live in San Francisco. I worked as a soda jerk at an old-fashioned ice cream and soda shop for some time. Um, and there I had an opportunity, too, to talk about the history and the science. I've done cocktail demos at the science, um, the California Academy of Science in San Francisco, and I'm going to be doing a little food and drink science here today. So I'm excited to share that with you guys. Yeah, I'm really excited to see that. Anne's going to do a, cool, a couple cool demos, actually, I think, uh, the science of food and the science of drinks. And next up we have Emily. Hi, I'm Emily Fink, or Celix on the internet. I am a science communicator, and I am a costumer, and sometimes I do both at once. So I go to uh, science fiction conventions, put on a costume, and talk about science. Very good. And we have, uh, we've been invaded by Canada, but we seem to have driven one of our Canadians out, or two actually at this point, since we got rid of, uh, got rid of uh, Jason. But now, uh, Julius, can you... Tell us a little bit about what you do, since I have absolutely no idea what you do. <laughs> so tell Certainly. me what you do. Sure. Um, I am basically a scientific illustrator. Uh, mostly I specialize in paleo art, or the restoration of ecosystems and animals and plants and so on from a long time ago. Deep time, we're talking like from the time of the dinosaurs or even before. Um, I work with uh, museums, uh, book publishing companies, um, individual researchers, uh, to restore animals that we can't go out to photograph anymore, and I use a combination of uh, painting, uh, mostly digital, as well as some photographic compositing techniques, and I try to make these things as realistic as possible uh, to give uh, readers, uh, viewers of the material, hopefully as accurate a view of what it was probably like to stand there in the Mesozoic or before as possible, and I use my uh, scientific background as much as I can to bring it into the artwork as well. I uh, had a, I did a graduate school in um, ecology uh, in interesting areas of the world uh, before a master's in, in Jasper area studying uh, weird mosses that uh, that respond positively to elk trampling and I did uh, my PhD in microbiology where I studied uh, bacteria from the bottom of the ocean 
uh, uh, hydrothermal vent communities as well as um, salt spring communities. And so it's, I have an interesting sort of bit of research experience to draw on that um, isn't always directly applicable to my artwork uh, in terms of the subject matter, but uh, I really do appreciate the, the whole way in which science is done. And um, I, I try to push for that in my artwork uh, as much as possible by being as rigorous as possible in the reconstructions. Awesome, and it looks like we have Glendon back now. Glendon, can you say hello? Or are you muted? Or I not? think so. All right, we got Glendon. This is so <laughs> Hi. exciting. Sorry about Glendon, that. Glendon, tell us. Uh, we, we've basically just been doing introductions and telling everyone the basic art that we do. And uh, so now it's your turn. Tell everyone what you do. Great. Um, I started out as a fine artist and then ended up doing a lot of illustration work and blogging about that on uh, my blog, The Flying Trilobite. And uh, from there, I also joined uh, Scientific American when they launched their new blog network. And I'm part of the team on Symbiotic, uh, the intersection of science and art blog on that network. And uh, in addition to that, I guess I end up talking a lot to uh, different people involved in the intersection of science and art. And for everyone or just me? He froze. <laughs> All right. So hopefully we'll be able to get Glennon back because trust me everyone, he's really fascinating. So I guess what we could start talking about is uh, is communicating an important aspect to your work and I think that pretty much all of us on this panel are going to say yes because a lot of us spend time actually going out and promoting our work so we're, we're actually sort of uh, unusual in terms of you're a normal artist in that we put ourselves like on these types of panels and actually try to put our art into into words, which is, can be something that's very difficult for artists. Uh, there's a famous quote I think that if if I could say it in words, I wouldn't need to paint. And I think a lot of artists sort of feel that way that we have we have a difficult time explaining ourselves, so we use illustration and painting and other visual arts in order to sort of express ourselves. And one of the things that science and art, when they are combined, try to do is to explain science with their art. And so I was wondering if any of the panelists could sort of talk about how they do that. Um, maybe we could start with Julius, because I think it's really fascinating the sort of uh, the paleo art that you're doing. If you could talk a little bit about how, how you, you know, express the science with your work and do you feel that you have to dumb down the science when you're doing it or do you feel that you can keep it as highbrow as say the scientists work? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I don't think like for, for the kind of work that I do um, it's a lot of it is something that tends to be interesting anyway to a lot of the public. Uh, I know that there are many areas of science that are generally not so much read about by the public probably less so things like molecular biology, right? So, uh, whereas the kind of science that I uh, popularize with my art, mostly, although not exclusively, uh, paleontology, tends to be a very, very popular area anyway. Now, granted, there's a lot of information in paleontology journals that the public is generally not aware of as easily because a lot of the stuff just doesn't circulate um, as much as possible. And part of that is because it hasn't necessarily been popularized maybe the way that it could be. And it would be interesting to expand on that in the future by the various kinds of outreach programs. And some people are really doing a great job of doing that. But in general, paleontology is so popular that I don't think that in general I'd need to uh, feel the need to, to dumb it down in any way to people because a lot of this stuff is, is, is quite well, quite familiar. I mean, you find five-year-olds running around uh, being able to say Micropachycephalosaurus without, uh, you know, whoa, skipping whoa, whoa. a beat or something. I can't <laughs> say that. Wait a minute. <laughs> Micropachy or what? <laughs> Yeah, some of these dinosaur names, um, I'm, I'm just blown away how kids will just rattle them off. Uh, so I'm not sure why completely we lose, a lot of people lose that interest in paleontology, whereas you have an enormous proportion of kids that seem to enjoy it. So uh, some of my job is to try to uh, engage the rest of the public in the interest in, in paleontology uh, through the use of imagery. and. Um, you know, it's not like it needs a lot of promotion because it tends to be pretty popular, but people do enjoy pictures. And um, I try to bring as much of the science into it as possible. 
A uh, large way in which I do this is I love to work with researchers. Uh, having been a researcher myself in the past, I can understand the kinds of uh, uh, issues that, that are important in research or that, that, that people uh, in research are dealing with and, and how, how basically the, uh, the system works uh, in terms of communication and, and, and the various kinds of... Um, well, there's many kinds of labs in the world, but how, how things generally work in labs. And, and, and so it kind of, it helps me to understand how to work well with researchers, I find. Uh, so far, it's gone really well. And so when they'll want to describe, let's say, a new taxon, a new species or genus of dinosaur or, or other animals or plants, they'll sometimes come to me and um, uh, get me to, uh, to commission me to do an illustration that will be released uh, basically as a press release when the journal article is published. And this can be anything from, you know, a new species of dinosaur to something about the ecosystem in which these animals lived. Um, the latest one actually is a really good example. It came out uh, a few days ago on the, uh, the way in which different species of large uh, plant-eating dinosaurs in the, in the late Cretaceous managed to survive together and not outcompete each other. And so it was an ecological... Uh, paper basically by Jordan Mellon and uh, Jason Anderson and uh, the idea was to, to make this nice big scene of several dinosaurs feeding together on different kinds of plants so you can use the artwork to demonstrate uh, ecological principles as well and I draw in my background a little bit on this as well so the idea is to try to bring in as many of these kinds of interesting um, new discoveries into the art as possible and then of course going on to museums uh, I'll work with museums as well when they're uh, producing new exhibits on prehistory or uh, other areas and try to bring even more so to the public in some sense that way some education about science because I work closely with paleontologists and museum curators to design these uh, images, large murals for exhibits uh, that try to show the public, if not necessarily how, how dense the animal life was back at certain times because, you know, they try to cram as much together as possible for the exhibits, at least what's around and, and to help explain with pictures to support the, the text as well. So that's some of what I do that way and how I bring some of the science into my artwork. I really want to give the other people a chance to talk about it. It sort of interests me what you're saying. Uh, do you ever use sort of your own, uh, like are you bridging sort of this gap of our understanding by using your own creativity? Do you think that you, you kind of come up with like, maybe you don't know what the plant life was specifically that those dinosaurs ate? Are you being creative when you make your art that's supposed to depict it? Because you're sort of like dancing on the edge of what we know mm -hmm. and what we don't know. And I think that it's a really important thing to highlight. That's why artists are important to the scientific process and to help scientists, you know, express art to the public. But uh, you know, it makes you wonder, are you sort of giving them ideas maybe as to what they should look into, or are you creating your own you know, like definition of what a dinosaur looks like? Well, I try to be as rigorous as possible. So there's actually a lot of information available now in, in the fossil record, and that has been researched by paleontologists in terms of not just the dinosaur skin texture and sometimes even color, but the, the plant life, the, the, often the species of plants that were present in an ecosystem. Uh, and so I, in, I basically include as much of that as possible. And sometimes we don't know everything, so we'll have to infer from other similar communities. Uh, in some cases, of course, there's also going to be some guesswork involved. But um, it's kind of a gradient of, of using as much knowledge as possible and then going down from there, uh, filling in as much as is necessary, but being as conservative as possible with it. Cool. Can you see this on your screen? Uh, yes, yes, yes. It's Can nice you recognize what dinosaur that is? Well, it looks like it's a tyrannosaurid a... of some right. sort. Yeah. It's small on so, my screen, but yeah. One of the, yeah, it is. So one of the things I was going to do today, I was going to try to tie in, and I swear Anne and Emily, I'm going to get to you guys right after this, but I wanted to sort of tie in the fact that this conference is really fantastic in that it is online and it's using technology and it's allowing all of us to basically be here in our pajamas right now, you know, giving a conference, and it's allowing people from all over the world not to have to pay a dime except for their internet connection to be able to hang out with us. And I think that's really fantastic, and it's like the wave of the future, and I wanted to support that somehow. And so my desk right now is covered with a, a plethora of extra necklaces that I have, so I wanted to do some giveaways while we're doing this panel. And since we were just talking about dinosaurs, and I happen to have this Tyrannosaurus Rex here on my desk, 
I want to give it away on Twitter. So for everyone, you can see on my screen that I am at Surly Amy. So all that you have to do is be the first person to tweet an answer to a question that I'm going to give, and then you can win this necklace. And what will happen is I will follow you back, and then you can DM me your address. And I've done this one other time when I did Cosmo Quest, and I did a terrible job of taking notes. So if you end up with a different necklace, I apologize, because that might happen. But right now, if you can tweet at me whatever that dinosaur was that Julia said earlier that I can't pronounce, if you can be the first person to tweet that dinosaur at me, at Surly Amy, I will then send you this. But if you're a troll, any one of the trolls that likes to stalk three thought blogs, then sorry, you're not going to win. But anybody else, any happy little people out there, just tweet at me, uh, at Surly Amy, and I will send you this uh, Tyrannosaurus Rex. And then let's go to Anne and see what she has to say, because I know she does an excellent job of communicating science through amazing sort of... Uh, displays and, and little projects that you show, and I'm losing the word for what that would actually be. But Anne, if you have a chance, tell us a little bit about how you share science through your art of cooking. Thanks, Amy. I think that um, that I, I get kind of an easy path with working with food, uh, just because most people really enjoy eating and drinking, and so that's a really easy way to get them interested in what you're saying. Um, one of the, my favorite things about cooking is the kind of instant gratification element of it, that um, when I work on an art project, I get to share it immediately with others or just eat it or drink it myself, um, and that makes it really rewarding. Uh, so I think it's, I've had a, um, a really fun time communicating the science that I've learned about the things that I make. Uh, on the question of whether it's dumbed down, I, the science that I share is um, kind of by necessity dumbed down because I don't know much more um, myself than what I read. So if I can understand it, then I'm comfortable sharing it. But much deeper than that, I, I can't go too far. Um, but I'm learning a little more about the things that I read about all the time. Um, and that's exciting. One of my favorite resources for food and drink science is Harold McGee. Um, he has an excellent book called On Food and Cooking that gets really in-depth. It's, it's a sort of encyclopedic. It was one of my wedding presents <laughs> from a friend of mine um, that gives you any idea of what my reputation is with my friends. Um, and, uh, and as far as uh, drinks go, um, Dave Arnold is a man who came out of a culinary institute and does a lot of sort of molecular gastronomy type of stuff. Um, but I know Amy was referring to some of the demos that I've done um, at these the museums word. and also at Skeptricon, which is our con, con within a con at Convergence, uh, which is an annual sci-fi and fantasy convention in Minneapolis. Just happened this past Fourth of July weekend, um, and there it, it's it's cool because we're we're getting to talk to a crowd that doesn't normally read our blog necessarily or doesn't isn't plugged into the atheist secular skeptic community, um, but are still people who are very open to these ideas. Um, and so we do a whole track of science panels, and then every night there are party rooms, and I talk about the science of cocktails uh, while giving people cocktails. Um, and last year, one of the things that I made was a uh, drinks that glow under a black light. Um, okay, and essentially, right tonic water, okay, uh, main ingredient, after. is quinine. <laughs> and uh, quinine, it turns out, is fluorescent. So it will... Um, put off light when it's under UV light. And so I was able to do drinks that glowed blue in the dark um, and did a little talk about that before giving people their drinks. And you could tell this was a good crowd because um, when they stepped up to ask for a drink and we had them in test tubes, um, and I would say, you know, before you get this, you have to learn a little science. And they're like, yes, <laughs> awesome. Um, so we knew that they were our kind of people. Um, I was hoping to do a little demo like that today. I actually have a little too much light to do the black light, but I um, made yesterday a homemade tonic water. Um, so you can see it here in this jar. Probably doesn't look like the tonic water you buy at the store. Uh, it's dark brown. This is because the flavoring in it is coming from cinchona bark, which is a natural source of quinine. Um, and so it is brown. Um, and there's some lemongrass and lemon and lime peel and juice in here, as well as some sugar. Um, the, the tonic water you buy at the store is mainly corn syrup and synthesized quinine. Um, still perfectly fine to drink, but that's why it's clear. So this stuff has a little bit, um, a little more rustic <laughs> appeal. 
Um, but it tastes really good, so I'm having a gin and tonic right now uh, with it. And I, I'll have to find out later if I take this in a dark room. And I brought my little black light flashlight with me and see if it glows. Um, but I'll put a post up about this soon. But you can read a blog post about the fluorescent cocktail demos I did uh, at the con last year on Mad Art Lab. I believe Jason put a link on the event page, so you can check that out. Um, and I also, before I pass this to uh, to one of our other um, contributors, I want to share that one of the other things I do is actually help organize the Atheist Film Festival in San Francisco. Uh, and this is so obviously a public outreach event. This was founded five years ago by David Fitzgerald, who I believe a lot of you are familiar with, author of Nailed um, and a new book on Mormonism. Um, great guy. And he uh, started this film festival with a few other people five years ago to give atheists and skeptics and other secular heathens a way to see their views and values reflected on the big screen. Um, you often hear conservatives talk about how Hollywood is godless and um, doesn't reflect their views, but a lot of film, um, both fiction and nonfiction film, um, has this sort of you know wishy-washy. They, they love fate. You know everything means something. Of course, because it's if it's a fiction story, it means something because somebody else wrote it. Um, but not not a lot of films that really reflect our worldview. Um, so that's what this film festival is trying to do, um, as well as to give people outside of our community an idea of of what it's like to be a part of the community. Um, and this is actually something of a challenge I pose to everyone out there. Um, because a lot of the films that we get to show at the film festival are documentaries about the dangers of religion, um, whether it's um, you know things that religious people are doing to each other or the ways that they're trying to ruin science education and things like that. And we would really love to have more films that reflect a positive idea of what a scientific or secular worldview looks like. Um, we're really excited this year to be premiering Hug an Atheist, um, which you may have read about on Friendly Atheist or other places around the web. Um, by uh, Belgian director Sylvia, and I'm not even going to try to pronounce her last name because <laughs> I would be, I would mess it up. Um, but she went around for a, a year or two, I think, and interviewed atheists all around America. Um, and so she's going to be there with us in San Francisco. Um, September 14th is the festival. If you're going to be anywhere in the Bay Area around then, I highly encourage you to come out and check out our festival. That link is also on the event page. Awesome, and I'm going to jump in here really, really quick. Speaking of not being able to pronounce things, and I want to ask Julius. I think I have a winner on Twitter. Uh, is it Pachycephalosaurus? Was that the correct dinosaur, or is that something else? It was very close. Is that close uh, enough? I'm going to go with close enough. I, yeah, it's close enough. Sounds good. Yeah. My yep. my runner up was like Mega, and then someone just smashed the keyboard with their forehead. So I'm going to go with Pachycephalosaurus. Is sounds my winner. good. And the next yeah, one that I'm going to the next one I want to do in honor of Anne and the Atheist Film Festival is I like to give away one of my atheist pieces that I do. And it says, and I just flashed it really quickly, it's, it's atheist on the side. It says, a thoughtful, honest, ethical, something, something, something. If you can tell me what those last three words are, then I will send you this necklace. So it says, a thoughtful, honest, ethical, and then three more words. So tweet at Surly Amy what those three words are, and you'll get a free atheist necklace. And for the guy, uh, Harrison, I am going to follow you back. I need you to DM me your shipping address. And then I would like to talk to Emily, because Emily hasn't had a chance to talk. And she's a scientist. She's awesome. And she designs clothing and does all kinds of crazy, awesome things. So Emily, please tell us about yourself. Um, well, as Amy said, I design costumes primarily. Um, but the way I use that in science is that I'm an informal science educator. I've worked at a variety of museums and nature centers. And one of the things about informal education is people don't need to stop and listen to you, ever. Like, if you have a classroom, they have to sit there and listen to you and behave. The person at the museum can wander by, stare at you strangely, and then walk away. Um, so one of the things I'm always on the lookout to do is try to find ways to get people's attention. And one of the ways I accidentally hit on was by wearing my bad girl costume at the museum on Halloween one day um, and doing a bat demo. So I'm in a flight cage with a whole bunch of little brown, or they're big brown bats, but they're little animals. They're about that big. Um, but I was in the flight cage with six or seven big brown bats in my bat girl costume, and suddenly I'm getting 
all the questions, like more questions than I ever got. I used to do this program on a at least three times a week basis. And it turns out that people who are afraid of bats are not afraid of the girl in purple shiny spandex. <laughs> so they're willing to talk to the girl in purple shiny spandex even though she still has these creatures that they're terrified of for no good reason. Um, and then they're willing to listen and to learn about the bats. Um, and then I started doing that at sci-fi conventions. But I also wanted to go off of what Julia said um, about museums and artists. Working and changing exhibits, we were always so excited when a good artist was involved in creating the exhibit because then we didn't have to spend that first five minute interaction going, this is not correct. This is a dinosaur, but it's not really what it would look like. We could start that first five minute discussion with, yeah, this is fuzzy, but it's a baby T-Rex. And people are fascinated. And it makes it easier if we have good art. It makes it the communication quicker. It gives them something to look at. It gives them something to combat the misinformation that they've had or the old, outdated information that they've had. And they're much more likely to remember the six-foot-tall, baby, fuzzy T-Rex than they would the science communicator standing in front of the bad T-Rex model going, oh, this isn't what they look like. Whoa. Do we have Glendon here still? Glendon, are you are you here? See Glendon. <laughs> I see Glendon. I can't hear Glendon. He cannot hear us. I'm so very sad about this. All right. So what else should we talk about then? We can't hear Glendon. Maybe he should unmute himself if he's muted. Um. I guess. Uh, is that better? Oh my gosh! Is that any better? <laughs> Yay, there's great. one thing. Can hear you. So basically, we've been talking about how we use our art to communicate with the general. Public. I tried. <laughs> <laughs> Is it working at all? Yeah, we can hear you. There might be a delay. <laughs> Sorry, I'm gonna have to hold uh, my. Right. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, sorry for all the technical troubles. I uh, I just tried two different webcams and and now I'm on my iPhone, so we'll we'll go with that. <laughs> but hooray for Max. Um, so yeah, I, I caught a lot of that. Um, and uh, I you know absolutely I think that using art for uh, science communications, uh, you know, science communication in so many different ways is just integral to. Uh, you know, all sorts of education. It's um, as Emily said, it can act as a shortcut. Um, the one thing that I like to consider is, uh, you know, when you're watching a PowerPoint presentation and uh, somebody is reading it line for line, uh, it'd be much more interesting for the audience to have a, a strong visual while somebody's narrating, um, rather than just reading a PowerPoint. Most people's eyes can track a, the words on a PowerPoint much quicker than the person can read them uh, out loud. And I, I think that's uh, and. Science communication and, and the intersection of science and art, at this point, we've seen so many articles the last five years even of, uh, you know, surprise, they work well together. And it it's not a surprise anymore. It's, uh, you know, I, I don't know that they were ever that far apart, um, except that humanities tends to often be relegated in a separate realm than, than science, and it should be in some ways. Um, but I, one of the things that I find that's actually quite interesting is it's almost... Um, it's very difficult to find uh, artwork that's about atheism in particular. And there's a couple of types, I think. Um, there's maybe instructive educational artwork, um, uh, things that are maybe more science-based that might run counter to a different type of doctrine or faith's uh, idea of the early, especially the early part of the world or what the universe is, is constructed like. Uh, and there's also the critical ones, the, the political cartoons that are sort of savvy and, and you know, um, telling a little critical story a, about religion. But actual atheism fine art is a, it's a hard thing because it's, it's the absence of something uh, in, in many ways. So it's, you don't see too many uh, examples of something that is pro-atheism uh, in a painting. And I've spent a lot of time trying to think about what what do you paint? Um, anybody have any good ideas for what would you paint to or what how would you make atheist art? 
Yeah, I, I can jump in on this because I've actually been thinking about this a lot lately. Um, I don't think I don't think that the that atheist art is so much or should be about the absence of things, but more more about our journey and sort of documenting the human experience. I, I've been really moved by a lot of the masters that have painted religious artwork, and I've spent a lot of time in museums. When I was when I was younger, my, my mother used to tell me that the museum was our church because I was raised atheist, and so that's sort of. And she was she's an artist as well, and so we would go there sort of to worship, right? So I would wander off and, and I would go into like the old Italian painting rooms with all the you know these really beautiful like gilded, flat, sort of religious pieces, and I was really moved by them. And I wasn't moved because I cared so much about their story, but I was moved by the way that they painted, and I thought it was really fantastic, and it really influenced my artwork. And I think that we need more painters in our community to sort of step forward and, and paint more about the human experience. I think that what atheist painters of the future and maybe now should care more about is is the ideas that we're trying to express and less so much of the hero's journey which is what I think religion religious pieces painted so much you know and I think in atheism too as a community we sort of need to step back from this like hero worship that I see happening you know and you can see in skepticism and atheism where people sort of lose the religion and they they substitute it with uh, this idea that I'm now gonna idolize uh, you know whoever Christopher Hitchens Richard Dawkins there's Whoever is, you know, and these are all important people that have given great meaning to our ideas, but I think that what is really going to be important in the long run is the ideas. And, and realizing that we can find joy, you know, in the experience of not having a God, that we can find joy in science, and we can find joy in truth, and that we can still have that sort of transcendent feeling that art can give without having, you know, religious iconography in it. We need to create our, our, our own tales now. And I, I'm, I'm really inspired by just talking about that sort of thing. Like, I, I'm working on a painting right now that has, it, it's sort of silly, the painting I'm doing. It's, it's uh, fish in space, believe it or not. But it, it's sort of an homage to a couple of things, the idea of Russell's teapot, and then also the fact that there were fish that scientists took out into space to study. And it's these sort of ideas and this learning that is so ultimately human that it's something that I think we need to see more of in the arts. And there's so there's so much that atheists I think can paint about without it being specifically about not believing. That's my spiel. <laughs> Anyone else want to add to that? Well, I would say I'm. My atheism is very tied up in a love of nature and being impressed by the forces of nature, whether that's um, evolution, ecosystems, animals, all of those. I'm fascinated and inspired by the things that exist and by the fact that humans can create meaning in a meaningless, in a world that is devoid of any innate meaning. And I think that's something that I would love to see more of in art, is humans making their own meaning, people creating joy and beauty. And I've seen good examples of that in art, and I can't think of them right now. They're probably in the quickies <laughs> on our blog. Yeah, I think that I have to agree. I mean, for me as well, I mean, I, I see a very interesting sort of a uh, both uh, possibilities of the human experience and, and showing how we can exist and make beautiful things without having to resort to uh, you know some divine inspiration as well as uh, again with scientific background um, the the beauty of the natural world on its own and just kind of highlighting that uh, for me I guess I'm just my main problem with uh, with religion is that it tends to especially with fundamentalist religion of the types that tend to uh, have a very strong uh, doctrine about a creator and these ones that especially uh, have anti-scientific doctrines um, and I am out to try to counter this kind of misinformation that uh, many of these roots of creationism tend to try to uh, disseminate into the public and so that's where my artwork comes in as well and I can see how both of those areas of, of, of the human experience as well as the 
the natural world are, are so, I think, important uh, to me in, in, in communicating artwork and how important that is. And uh, a good, good example of, of, of atheistic artwork, in a sense. It's, it's kind of, also like Leonard was saying, it's kind of an absence um, of, of, of the one piece, and as you were saying, uh, Amy, about the, the, the hero sort of centerpiece, in a sense. We don't need that. It's, the world is beautiful on its own, and it's nice to be able to just highlight that. Yeah, I, I also, I like to think a lot about um, how scientists and artists are alike. It's one of the things that I sort of try to, to highlight whenever I do some of these panels. There's sort of this stereotype that, that artists themselves are supposed to be sort of space cadets, that we're sort of like dancing on the edge of what's real, and we're stoned, or we're high all the time, or we're, you know, we're drinking sake at 11 o'clock in the afternoon. I mean, all these terrible stereotypes about artists. Um, that make them come across as stupid and unable to embrace like complex ideas. And scientists, on the other hand, are often depicted as being very, very rigid and unfun and serious and taking notes all the time. And I try to show people that it's actually not true and that those stereotypes are sort of melting into each other and that artists, when they create, are sort of uh, using the scientific method in a way where they're taking the available data that they have around them. They're, they're coming up with a hypothesis as what, what they can do with this available data. Maybe their available data is you know, some pencils and some paper and the latest you know, research on dinosaurs. And they're taking that and they're saying, what can I do with this? And then they do experiments in their studio. And then they come up with a result. And then they try to decide if that is a, you know, is a good result or not. And then they sort of present it to their peers, and it's peer-reviewed. And so the artists are actually utilizing the scientific method. And in a very similar, it's obviously not as exact and it's not, you know, we don't have to be as precise and we don't have to double-blind ourselves. But we're, we're definitely using the scientific method in a very similar way that scientists do. And I think that scientists also are very creative. And you look at people like Richard Feynman and, and all these different scientists that were also musicians or were very much interested in creativity. And I think that you can find a very interesting parallel between the two worlds. And I, I hope that the two communities can overlap even more in the days to come. And I'm wondering if any of you, and Emily, you can speak to this sort of both ways. Um, are there any scientists that have influenced your artwork, and are there any artists that influenced your science? Um, well, um, actually, in more less of me being influenced, as, or less of a one-way thing. My best friend is an artist, um, a commercial artist, and her one of her hobbies is to draw um, dinosaurs and draw animals as if they were, or to draw fictional animals as if they were real. So she uses dinosaur body plans to create dragons, um, and she puts a lot of work into the skeletal structure. So as a forensic anthropologist, she and I, I spent a lot of time talking to her about skeletal structures. She spent a lot of time um, asking questions of me, and by being able to explain to her how things were working, I actually get a better idea of how skeletal structures work. Like when I have to say, no, this bone works this way because it's performing this function, that actually gives me a much better idea of how skeletal system is working within the body as well as giving her a better idea of how to draw an, a dragon as if it was a real not really the answer to your question, but in my life, that's been the main um, art and science standpoint, is having that person who is so um, opposite of me, but also shares lots of the same interests. Glendon, are you back? I think he's frozen. frozen? <laughs> yeah. It's going to be just our mascot for this panel. Yeah. <laughs> Julius, why don't you t tell us a little bit? Have there been any, any scientists that you've worked with that have been particularly inspiring to you, or any scientists that you've sort of read about that have inspired your work at all? 
Absolutely, I mean, there's been lots. <laughs> uh, a lot of them that I've worked with uh, in, the, in the past as well. Uh, uh, Dr. Michael Ryan, uh, David Evans, um, a whole bunch of others as well, Jordan Mellon. And basically, I mean, they inspire me uh, in the sense, and, and many others that I've read the work of that I haven't worked on directly with. They inspire me in the sense that I have a an innate interest in science anyway, especially having been able to do some of the research myself. It's really exciting to get results uh, from an experiment that you've de designed and conducted. So I can understand the kind of excitement that goes into making those discoveries. Uh, and I, that's why when I read science stories on some of the news feeds uh, and I see something new that you know wasn't known before, and I think, wow, this is so fascinating. I just, just want to illustrate it. You know, I just want to make something new and so when I get time aside from some of the other projects I try to do that but um, it, it's it's the the beauty of the natural world and the the fascination with an excitement from discovery uh, that really drives a lot of my artwork and um, it's basically so self-sustaining I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be doing what I'm able to do um, for a living this way because it's something that I would be wanting to do anyway um, and it's just fascinating to see you know, new things discovered like this. So that part really does inspire me just because of, uh, I have a nature of, of, I enjoy discovering new things. Uh, in terms of uh, the, uh, so I guess that's the, the scientist's um, influence on, on my artwork in that sense. And in a sense also the, the, the science itself uh, and the fascinating personalities that I deal with. And, and there's some great people that I've worked with in the past. Yeah, that's an interesting thing that you bring up, that you you know how, how lucky we are to be able to do what we love. It's very, very difficult for an artist to make a living, and it's even more difficult for an artist to make a living in a very specific field like uh, scientific illustration. And I'm wondering if uh, either Emily or Julius, if you have any sort of uh, advice that you might give to other younger artists that are now starting out. Like I know in my case, I would tell every artist that I know to go and get themselves a business degree, <laughs> at least if you're going to do something like I do. Because when I first started out as an artist, uh, I was a painter primarily, and I still paint, but I had decided that that was it. I was I was like Picasso, and I was going to paint, and that was it. And so I opened an art gallery at, in Hollywood, and I thought you know, that I had figured it all out, and I was going to put art by the people for the people up on the wall. and. And it was this grand dream, and it was terrible. Like, I, I ended up bankrupt. Like, I lost everything. And it was very traumatic for me. But in the end, it, it taught me a lot about business. That probably would have been, I would have been better off if I had just gone and gotten a business degree, quite frankly, instead of having a business that failed terribly so that I would learn about business. So my advice always when I meet young artists is, is you know, come, like, come up with a way you know, a serious way that you're going to make money, or at least realize that you're going to have to integrate yourself into a larger corporation, and and you know, and be okay with that. Because a lot of times, as an artist, you just want to be creative and fancy free, and 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 do you know what you feel is right. And I totally respect that, but you also have to be able to pay the bills. And I think that you know, it's sad and it's very difficult for artists in in this current day and age because it's very hard to make money. So my advice is to to get yourself some at least some sort of a business degree or some sort of degree in something. And uh, Julius, would you give any advice? And then Emily, would you give any advice to any younger artists out there? I think that in itself is, is, is a great piece of advice. Uh, be familiar with um, not just how to do the artwork, but also how to market it. Um, because, yeah, you're right. I mean, if you're not, if you don't have a backup plan, and go right into it. Um, you know, maybe you'll be lucky. Maybe you'll you'll hit that particular area, that market that that is very uh, successful. But you know, there's also a chance. It's hard to predict exactly how people are going to respond to things, and sometimes you don't see it coming. I guess. And I was lucky in the sense that I gradually moved into this area from from a different uh, from science itself. So I was basically holding down two different uh, kinds of jobs at the same time until I knew that it was working. Um, but um, Aside from that, I mean, in terms of uh, scientific illustrators, I think the key thing that I would uh, tell people is just make sure that uh, what you're doing, you know, you be as it's a tough one because I'd say you know be as um, be as rigorous and 
careful as you can in terms of the the science of it. But at the same time, it's it's art as well, right? So um, you want to make sure that you don't stifle people's creativity too much. So um, I try to uh, do things and not stifle my creativity, but still, you know, keep it within the bounds of what's um, what's accurate because, it, you know, I. It's not nobody likes to be uh, criticized about something that they did incorrectly. Let's say, um, so just read a lot, right? I mean, like I think that's the main thing in in, in science, scientific illustration: read a lot, uh, be up to date with uh, what's out there, what's known, and and what are the issues, um, and uh, yeah, I mean that that in itself I think is is, is uh, keeps a person interested anyway. Emily, what what would you say? Well, my thing is I specifically chose not to be an artist professionally because I can't make the kind of art I want to make and sell it. Um, couture clothing is not something people can make a living on in the way I want to do it. Um, if I made and sold my costumes, they would be very, very expensive. And worth part. every penny because they would be. They're they are they're worth it. That's the thing about artisans. Um, okay. if you look on Etsy, the number one comment I see on Etsy stuff is why is this so expensive? Well, it's expensive because you have an artist making it. Um, and people are particularly not used to paying a premium for clothing that is made one at a kind at a time rather than uh, mass produced. So I chose to not make art professionally. Um. And to channel my creative um, propensity into science communication and do costumes on the side, and I'm actually really, really happy with that path. But um, I'm also someone who has the time to do creative projects on the side. So. That's awesome. Work and I see, I see Jason's jump back in here. Before I'm going to let him say anything, I am going to do one more final giveaway on Twitter. So I have this new design that I haven't even posted in my, my little shop yet, and it says on it, if you are going to spend your life believing in something, it should be yourself. And so this is a new little slogan for the atheists out there. And the answer that I'm going to be looking for is who said, and not this quote, but this quote, I have never believed in God, but I believe in Picasso. If you can tweet at me who said that quote, and you can use your Google Foo if you want to to figure it out. The first person to tweet at Surly Amy, who said, I've never believed in God, but I believe in Picasso. I will send you my latest design for free. And so now Jason's back. Hey, Jason, what kind of art do you do? <laughs> Nothing whatsoever. <laughs> I can't I even finger paint. That. We never got to get into the discussion about what actually is art. Which is a oh, that's... to talk about, and I would argue, Jason, that you are probably an artist and you just don't know it yet, and that your blog and that the work that you do might actually be your yeah. art. I have a performance art. Have a, yeah, I have a very, very broad view on what actually defines what art is, and I think that a lot more people are artists than actually acknowledge that they are. So. That's a very expansive view. Uh, yeah. I have two questions from the chat room that I'd like to relay. Okay. Uh, first question is what from happened to Bible Mail. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> I, I actually saying. answered that to the chat room. So, <laughs> um, right, first sorry, question yeah. is from Bible Name. Uh, how can atheist artists under a secular or atheist banner make inroads into social issues as opposed to in science fields? I wasn't listening because I just got a winner for <laughs> the answer. So you're gonna have to say that to me again because I obviously cannot multitask. But the answer to who, who said, I've never believed in God, but I believe in Picasso, the answer is Diego Rivera. And uh, I'm a big fan of Frida Kahlo and Mexican folk art, so that's why I, there's a shout out, a shout out, a shout out, drink and socket 11, a shout out to, uh, yeah, Bible name. Bible name was the person on Twitter that said that. Okay, so, okay, so you now guys, you have to answer his question. Yeah, now he has a question, too. This, he's our only viewer, so what did he <laughs> There is at least one other, thank yeah. you. Okay. I'm sorry. What was the question? Uh, how can atheist artists under a secular or atheist banner make inroads into social issues as opposed to in science fields? Hmm. 
Well, in the exact same way that we do all of the other art that we do that is trying to uh, educate on science and educate on social justice issues. And uh, there, there's so many fantastic artists that do this, and, and we need, we actually need more people in the secular community doing the same sort of thing. But, uh, like, Shepard Ferry pops to mind. I'm not a huge fan of his work, but he does a really fantastic job of sort of spreading memes when it comes to sort of social justice issues. Like, he's super famous for his Obama Hope posters, which you can, you know, there, there's a whole panel that we can have on him alone as to, you know, did he steal that photograph, and was that derivative work, and, and things like that. But the point being is that he has spread messages and probably did a really great job of helping get that particular person elected. And we need people that are interested in like feminism and other social justice issues to come forward and create art based on that. And you just do it in the exact same way that you educate on science. You, know, you, you find something that's important and that you're passionate about and you create good art and then you do your darndest to uh, promote that and get it out there. And you can do that by... Um, I, I don't ever like to, you know, advocate that artists work for free, because I think we're so underpaid as it is, especially musicians and other performance artists and things like that. But um, in terms of the internet, you know, there's a lot of ways that you can get your art out there and, in payment, like receive, you know, at least credit or or, or something or a link back to a shop where you sell prints of your work. But I think that there's, you know, there's tons of ways, and it's exactly the same that you way that you would spread any other type of science message or atheist message, you just, you know, find those avenues that are already talking about that and join forces with them. Let me ask a quick follow-up question that's my own, of Emily okay. and Julius. What, outside of atheism and art, lights the fire in your belly? What, uh, what causes <laughs> get you riled up? Science, uh, evolution, science denialism. Um, and trying to figure out how to communicate those. There's actually a lot of, I think, it's a good way art can come into social causes is uh, some of the best communication of climate science has been through videos and through radio segments that are produced and thought about and very carefully, very careful artistic decisions made to communicate subjects. Yeah, what I mean, up, I, Julius? absolutely. <laughs> I, I, I like that. That's that's exactly it. I mean, for me as well, it's the uh, it, it's the science and uh, in a positive way, and it's the science denialism that in a negative way that gets me all riled up. Um, and uh, you know, in addition to that, a couple of other things, maybe some sorts of uh, conservation issues. Uh, with my ecological background, I've I've dealt with a lot of. Uh, Areas that are very sensitive um, to damage from, you know, they're just even just being walked on or or, or other sorts of things. So I'm a big, um, I, I get very um, uh, up in arms about some of the kinds of problems like uh, overfishing of, say, sharks and so on. Um, so that kind of thing also. But uh, there's uh, there's one other question from the chat room that I'd like to pose, uh, Avicenna of Free Thought Blogs asks, at, at what point does art inspired by atheism become propaganda? You know, I've been asked that question before. I was on a humanities panel at TAM, and propaganda is just a really loaded word. I think that it becomes propaganda when you disagree with what it is. I mean, otherwise, it's just art that's sending a message. So I think that asking what is propaganda, well, if somebody disagrees with what the message of your art is, then they're going to say it's propaganda. You know, if someone agrees with the message that your art is sending, then it's not propaganda anymore. It's a message. So it really just sort of depends on what side of the fence you're on with that particular piece of art. The other thing about propaganda is um, in the past, at least some of the good examples of the propaganda that we can think of have also uh, been in support of ideologies that uh, are either harmful uh, to a large group of people or are incorrect in a very major way um, and can be demonstrated to be so. And so, I mean, atheism is really just a, 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 a you know, or, or, or anything in support of atheism is basically a way of saying, uh, let's um, allow people to think freely, right? Um, and don't be constrained by religious ideologies. So, 
I don't know. I, I find it very difficult to call that propaganda at some point. <laughs> yeah, a Christian will call it propaganda. Absolutely. Right, but I'm biased. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah, it just depends on whether or not you agree with what is being said. So I sort of hate that word in a way. And I use yeah. it like as a joke. Like I pass out business cards and I say, here's some propaganda. But, uh, yeah. So uh, that's it for the questions at the moment. So you have, we have five, five minutes, minutes left to wrap up. I would like to thank the two people that managed to stay on this panel <laughs> with me today. <laughs> and and I'm re really pleased. And actually, thanks to Anne. And I'm really sorry to Glendon, actually, because he got booted off. I know he really wanted to be here. And if you have a chance, uh, definitely go check out Glendon's blog. Uh, it's on Scientific American. It's Symbiart. Is that how you pronounce it? Yeah. Symbiotic. 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 Okay, yeah. Uh, he's really fantastic, and I'm really, I'm really disappointed that he didn't get a chance to be with us. So hopefully, maybe we can do this again sometime and have a chat with London. And again, I'd really like to thank uh, Free Thought Blogs for setting this up, and thank you, Jason, for for doing this. It was a really great idea, and I and I hope that it's something that we can continue in the future to do because I think it's sort of the wave of the future. You know, the more the more internet we can have in our brains, the better. You know, so we're all going to have Google glasses, and we're all just going to walk around and be able to flash yeah. our art up on the screen. Yeah. And, I'm waiting and, for Google Retina. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, we'll be able to have these conferences in our beds and our little pods that we will sleep in at that point. Great. It's the wave of the future, and it's something affordable, and I think that's important. People that can't really afford to go to these events get a chance to see and talk to all of us. So um, I think we'll pretty much wrap it up with that. Uh, again, I write for skeptic.org and madartlab.com, and you can find out more about my jewelry at surlyramics.com. And uh, anyone else want to give a shout-out to what they do? Emily and no. Julius? I write for madartlab.com, like Amy, and <laughs> I write for thisview.org, which is my personal blog, more focused on social justice and science communication. And I, um, I have a basically, I, I, I don't have too, I don't write too much these days. I'm pretty much swamped by the uh, the other work, but uh, my art work, the website uh, chitanyu.com, so that's my last name .com. Uh, and I also write occasionally on my uh, science blog, uh, Evolutionary Roots, which is R-O-U-T-E-S, um, and uh, just basically fascinating issues to me. <laughs> and if you're an artist out there and you're watching this right now, I just want to encourage you to continue to make art and to try, if you can, to take a more active role in the community uh, so that we can encourage you know, a more vibrant society and that we can document our journey. And I think that we really need the humanities to, to be at the forefront of social change movements because we need, we need the beauty and the inspiration and the joy and we need to share it. So get more active and if any of you are out there and you feel alone and you don't have any friends, please get in touch with us at madartlab.com at the contact link. We're always looking for more artists to get involved in the projects, the conventions that we do. Um, it's a really great community of people and we'd love to to have more people involved. So once again, go to madartlab.com, contact link, check us out, and, you know, we'll be your friends. And Jason, thanks again for hosting us and for, you know, sorry about all the technical difficulties. We'll it's do, we'll not do it again the next time. The internet time. does that. All right. Uh, before we hang up, I just wanted to say we peaked at 60 concurrent viewers, and everybody in the chat room is saying, oh, no, don't worry. It's definitely more than two of us here. <laughs> oh, thanks, <laughs> so. guys. And this will be up on YouTube, Great. so forever you can see it. And, yep. uh, and again, thanks so much. And go out there and make art. Everybody that's watching today is an artist. If you're creative in any way, go out there. I'm going to go after this, and I'm going to paint some fish out in space. <laughs> and it's, I mean, seriously, it's, it's, that, it's that wonderful to be an artist. So go paint some fish in space and then bring it back and show it to your peers and have it peer reviewed. And let's all make science and art together. I'm going to end the broadcast now. Thank you, panelists, and thank you, viewers. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Bye.